Welcome to the Artistic Finance Podcast, where we break down the wall between art and money. If you're here looking for how to be an artist and financially sustain a career, you're in the right place. Keep listening and join us as we learn about artists and how they make money work for them. Hello, everyone. This is your host, Ethan Steimel, here for Episode 4. Thank you for listening. I hope you are finding value in these discussions with brilliant artists. If you are able to, please leave a rating and review for our podcast. That way, other listeners will find us. Today's guest is musical theater writer and songwriter Taylor Ferreira. She has written the musical Propaganda, which she produced at the New York Musical Theater Festival. That show is now being turned into a musical podcast to be released later this year. With her a cappella group, The Perfect Fifths, Taylor arranges and performs songs. She co-wrote the Say Hello Sing-Along song for Jill Twiss's book, The Someone New. The song is available on the Harper Kids YouTube page. If you have children, they will love it. But be warned that it is an earworm and you will never be able to get it out of your head. Without further ado, let's get to our interview. Welcome, Taylor Ferreira, to the podcast. Thank you, Ethan Steimel. Great to be here. We're recording this April 30th, 2020, so we're in the middle of the COVID-19 coronavirus lockdown shutdown situation. Can you give a two-minute recap of your life, or your career, how, how you started to where you are right now? Yeah, I think we'll probably only need around 20 seconds for that. Um <laughs> I was an actor growing up, loved doing children's theater, studied acting in college, got a BFA, did summer stock when I was in college, moved to New York after college, started writing funny songs that I would put on YouTube, mainly like political satire songs, and that got a little traction. I'm a performer also. I sing with my a cappella group, The Perfect Fifths. So I'm still a performer, but I don't, you know, I don't audition. I started writing shows with my friend Matt, who I met in college. One of our shows was performed at New York Musical Theater Festival, RIP. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. RIP before coronavirus happened. Yeah, they have no excuse. They called it quits when the times <laughs> were the best of times, in theory. Yeah, so our show, <laughs> Propaganda the Musical, was in uh, Nymph. Ethan lit it. And then from there, Matt and I have written together a lot. I currently write for New York Film Academy when COVID doesn't happen. Working on projects with Matt and with Jill, with our mutual friend. I have to get Matt on the podcast. Yeah, you should. As well. He's way better at money than I am. Jill is amazing with money. And then I had Chuck Cooper on and his wife is a playwright and she's amazing with money. And I know you and I know Matt. So right now it's like I know these four playwrights who are all really good with money. So I'm wondering if I'm going to see like a trend here. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I think part of it is that to survive long enough to be successful, you have to be at least decent with money. You know, like if you're not, you're gonna, you're gonna struggle too much in New York, you're gonna work too many hours to just try to keep up with your spending habits. And then you're gonna eventually move away and and go into something more sustainable like you have to be have that depression era mentality to survive long enough i think to have any amount of success you've lived in new york for how how long uh it'll be 10 years in early september congratulations 10 years and going strong now questions about your creative personality also known just as your personality (laughs) what is your favorite theater show to go see as an audience member yeah that's hard it's hard for me i think anything that makes me feel something (laughs) different or like i I don't know besides anger uh (laughs) shows that make me angry are not my favorite things to watch my big examples of shows that I've walked out just loving. When I first moved to New York, I saw Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson, and that, you know, was different than any musical I'd ever seen. It made me, it inspired me as a writer. It inspired me as like, oh, wow, cool, different, funny musical theater is happening and is on Broadway right now. That's like awesome. And then on the other end of that spectrum when I saw Follies I like wept during it during what oh shoot I'm gonna sound dumb what's that song where like the young version of themselves are singing with the old version of themselves Ethan doesn't know no idea (laughs) maybe maybe you know someone out in in radio land does that number like oh I just bawled because it's just this classic 
musical theater tap dance performance like ugh, I don't know why I just I wept and then Hamilton you know I listened to Hamilton I got very into the album then I got to see it on Broadway and from the first notes I was crying so just like those shows that for whatever reason you know make me feel something intense other than anger because plenty of shows make me feel anger Right. Those are very three very different shows. Yeah. I remember I saw Follies with you, but you were like, but you had been like, I saw it and it's so good. And I went to see it and I was like, this is a depressing story. Not fun, not happy. It was too mature for me, I think. <laughs> and then Hamilton is one of those ones that I love. I've seen it twice. And both times it's like the audience loves being there. Like they are so happy to be there. And you just feel connected to everyone around you. And the energy is infectious. And that's sort of why I love that show. Besides the fact that it's a great show, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yeah. No, I agree. Like, everyone is feeling that thing that I felt at, from the very first notes. You know, it's like... And I had a concern about the stage version matching my expectations and matching the way the um, cast recording made me feel. Because, you know, I, I also... I grew up loving Jesus Christ Superstar, And that is a show that doesn't translate as well onto the stage. It's a better album than it is a show, in my opinion. And this is not, it's not the case for Hamilton. Like, I I was like, how could they add anything? How could any visual thing make this better? And they, they did. It's a fantastic production as well, which is exciting and nice. What is your favorite piece of art? There's a difference between what my favorite movie is that I I respect as like a piece of art and and film and a movie that I can watch at any point in time throughout my life and it will make me feel good. And those are the movies, those are the things I'm going to talk about. I I like, the other day I watched, I watched Gone with the Wind again and I I read it the other day too and I, I love it. It's highly uncomfortable to read, you know, in, in a lot of ways, but I, I can't help but just, like, love it. Um, I love that Olivia de Havilland is still alive. I don't know. I, I don't know what I love about it. It's probably just I was raised watching it every, like, Thanksgiving. So I watch When Harry Met Sally probably every year uh, in the fall. Television shows. I love The Office. Like, just things that are funny and bring me joy and that I can watch all the time are the things that I come to mind as my favorite pieces of art, even if they're not you know, sophisticated or highbrow. It's all opinion. It's all opinion, too. You said not to ask you this question, but I'm just going to ask anyway. What is your favorite art book or resource? I like those resources, especially when I'm teaching. Um, and I don't want to knock them for people who are not teaching and, and using them for themselves because I've heard nothing but good things. But I just don't read them. Uh, and maybe I should. Maybe they would help me. But I don't. And I... <laughs> Your answer is virtually the same as everyone else's. Chuck Cooper said the Tao Te Ching or something, which is like some sort of Asian Bible, which I thought was a great answer. But everyone else has virtually also said, like, I do what I want. Well, you know, sometimes I like to turn to the Book of Mormon, too. <laughs> You're talking about the musical? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, good. No, I'm not. <laughs> um, where do you draw inspiration from? People around me, my friends people I work with. When they're doing cool stuff, it makes me want to do cool stuff. I draw inspiration from literally the people I'm working with, like my collaborators, Matt or Jill, you know, when we're working on a project. And a lot of times when you have a a writing partner or someone that you are working with, it makes you inspired to complete a task a little bit more than if you're just doing it for yourself. If Matt and I, or if Jill and I are, are meeting on a certain day and I have said that I was going to finish, you know, an idea for a song, then I'm going to finish it by that day way more likely than if I just set that date for myself. That's an awesome answer. I love that answer. Um, what kind of music do you listen to? The Beatles, mainly the Beatles. (laughs) And then solo Beatles, Paul McCartney, John Lennon, George, the occasional Ringo solo song. You know, classic rock stuff. I like the Rolling Stones. I like Tom Petty. I like the Beach Boys. Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. I listened to them the other day. Jim Croce, inexplicably, I listened to the other day. All that kind of stuff is the stuff I I turn to. Do you have any hobbies? Yeah, I don't know. I uh, I guess I run sometimes. 
Well, I mean, I, I don't know if it's a hobby. I think documenting how far and fast I ran is my hobby. Running itself isn't the hobby. The feeling I have afterwards and the satisfaction of documenting my running is the hobby. I feel like all my hobbies are things that are either, yeah, either my jobs or career adjacent, you know? Jill said the same thing, like no hobbies. And I also don't have any hobbies because I think like as an artist, you work so much and it's a creative thing. You don't have time for hobbies. That being said, somebody said fishing and somebody else said cooking. That's great. Yeah, Neil golfs. I kind of wish I had a passion the other than this. I think maybe I'd feel more fulfilled right now. <laughs> you know, if I loved putting together puzzles or something, it'd be fun. If I loved knitting, knitting would be nice. Reading. I like reading sometimes. Not all the time, but sometimes. Okay, so now about sort of your financial personality. Um, and I'm going to start off with your demographics, but I'm going to have you describe them because I don't want to assign anything to you that you don't want to assign. Wow. That's very 2020 of you, Ethan. Um, I'm white AF, (laughs) but you know, Portuguese, German, Irish. I'm a millennial, pretty right smack dab in the middle of being a millennial. So you can take from that and guess how old I am. I'm a girl (laughs) or a woman, I guess, since I just told you essentially my age. I got my BFA in acting from West Virginia University, and I graduated high school. I was born in Florida, and I did some time in Minnesota. Then we moved to Maryland, (laughs) and then we moved to West Virginia. What did your finances look like when you started out? My family's not well off, but they're well off enough certainly helped me when I first moved to New York. I would have struggled a lot more if I didn't have that support for a couple months. But yeah, it was tough when I first moved to New York because I was, I had stupid jobs. You know, I was a hostess and I passed out flyers for Broadway shows and it wasn't enough. But luckily I moved up to being a server. (laughs) Luckily I got that serving job. Once that happened, I, I, I was fine. And then I started being able to save a little bit and whatnot. Oh, and I had debt from college when I first started. Oh, I'm so glad you brought that up. I'm so glad you brought that up because I think that's a huge thing. Yeah, because I mean, and Jill and I touched on it starting from zero versus starting from negative is a massive difference. Yes. I definitely started from negative, but again, I am definitely privileged in the sense that my parents filled in the gap for the first couple months of moving to New York. So I didn't have to stay at home and save for a year before I moved here or anything like that. I had some savings from my summer job that year, but not enough to move to New York off of. So I'm very grateful for that support and aware that's not what everyone has when they start off. You said you were a millennial, so it's almost like 90% we could have just assumed you have student debt. Yes. Oh, yeah. I mean, if I told you I had a degree, then yeah, I had student debt. I went to a state school and in West Virginia, I went to high school in West Virginia also. And in West Virginia, if you graduate high school, at least back when I graduated, if you graduate with a 3.0 or higher, which is not a high bar, you get a full ride scholarship to a state school. Whoa. As long and it's called the Promise Scholarship and as long as you graduate within 4 years, they pay for your tuition for a, any state school. So I had the Promise Scholarship. I had a couple other scholarships and grants and stuff like that. So my student debt was just because I was, you know, an acting major, so I literally I was in school all day and then in rehearsals at night, I couldn't work during the year. So it was just to pay like my rent and living expenses. But even that took me nine years, eight years to pay off. Amazing. So, but it's gone now. It is gone now. Yeah. The sad part about living today is that eight years, that's like a great, that's good. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Um, absolutely. (laughs) Many other of, of our peers, most, yeah, most of them still have their debt and, and a lot of it. Okay. Um, are you a saver or a spender? Um, I'm definitely a, a saver. If Taylor, right out of college, could see Taylor now, at least pre-COVID Taylor now, she would consider me a spender. Just because I'm not, like, literally counting every time I go to Dunkin' Donuts and, like, worried about how many ice lattes I have or, or things like that. You know, I'm, I'm not as concerned with that now, but, but I'm a saver. Nice. Risk-averse or risk-taker? A- averse, I would say. There's no right or wrong. <laughs> 
<laughs> is that right, Ethan? <laughs> Ethan, you know more about my financial state than most people. So, <laughs> well, it, yeah, it's sort of your both because you're risk averse in that you're pretty like savory. Uh, savory. <laughs> <I'm> <You're>, savory. <laughs> um, Not sweet. You're like a saver, but you also have a career in the arts, which I mean, you have to take risks all the like just to even start. Um, but I would say probably with your finances, you're risk averse. Did you grow up around finance? Did you have good examples when it came to money? I grew up around good examples in the sense that I grew up seeing parents who knew how to hustle, they knew how to get jobs, and they knew how to make it work and make money and stuff like that. But saving and stuff like that, I, I would say no. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's funny, I think when, um, I'm not saying you had bad examples, but if people, with that question, I think people are afraid to say, the people that haven't had a problem saying it are the people whose parents have died. Oh, Yeah. <laughs> No, I definitely, and you can cut this out, but I I, I am a little hesitant to go into too much details. I mean, my parents would both know, because granted, they had kids young, they had kids young, and they just like had to make it work. So they didn't have, they didn't have any time to develop their own financial skills before suddenly having two extra mouths to feed. I mean, I'm just going to say this because I know my parents will listen to this. Actually, I don't know that they will listen to this, those (laughs) ungrateful brats. (laughs) Um... They didn't teach me anything about money. They were good examples. Like they saved, we scrimped and saved. And so saving was like embedded in me, but they taught me zero about money. Like the the joke, I think that as a millennial, older people always just say this for whatever reason. They're like, oh, those people don't know how to balance a checkbook. But my parents never taught me how to balance a checkbook. I mean, I don't think it's complicated. It's like, what? You have some money and then you spend it and like, it's not complicated. Also, you don't need to do that that much anymore because everything's online. So like, yeah, you should be aware of what you're spending because sometimes there's a delay a day or two. But other than that, you don't need to balance a checkbook. What are you talking about? But not that my parents have ever complained about, you know, me not knowing how to, but they never taught me how to. Now I'm just sort of like complaining about things. <laughs> <laughs> I literally learned how to balance a checkbook in fifth grade, I think. My teacher, Mr. Vidmar, we had a whole like money section in class for like a week or something where we learned, you know, different denominations of money, which was stupid because I already knew what a dime was, but that like we practiced balancing a checkbook and then we invested in the stock market. Imagine, like, pretend, obviously, but like we got to pick stocks and I picked Disney. So that was the most education I think I ever had on, on, on finances was Mr. Vidmar in fifth grade. I was in 10th grade and our algebra teacher took like part of one lesson to explain to us why you might want to take out a second mortgage. Him explaining that was like convoluted at the time and I didn't even really understand it. Um, and I thought he was crazy for saying it would be good to take out a second mortgage. And he was serious and he was explaining to us mathematically why it was a good idea. But I think that was the most financial education I ever received in any schooling at all. And that was like 10 minutes of him just going off on this tangent. (laughs) What was the political landscape and culture that you grew up in? And did that influence how you view money? I know what you're asking. You're asking, do conservatives save money better because they're conservative? (laughs) I know, like the financial, like the 2008, like I feel like millennials, that was sort of a moment for us where... Even though none of us had any money at risk at that time. I certainly didn't. Coming from the kind of family that I came from, both of my parents are performers slash educators. My mom owned and operated a children's theater company for 20 years. And before that, she was a singer. My dad is in Orlando, Florida, and he's been an actor there for decades and a a show director. So he writes for Disney Entertainment, but he's an independent contractor. So neither of my parents really worked for any sort of union or company or anything like that that set up any retirement plans for them. They were affected by 2008, but only in the sense that the economy wasn't as great and strong and it people send their kids to children's theater school a little less and people maybe go to Disney a little less. But other than that, it didn't really affect them. But my family is a bunch of bleeding heart liberals. I'll be shocked if I get a conservative on this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I bet you'll get someone with family who is conservative. Oh, oh, absolutely. My family. My mom's family is conservative, but she ended up being a liberal. She grew a, a woman's heart. That's a Gone with the Wind reference. Um, 
Yeah, my dad's family, they're out in California. They're clearly liberals. So, but I wouldn't say it influenced my view on my personal finances. Um, have you had any health challenges? No, thankfully. I've always had to have insurance because I have asthma. So I always need to like be able to get a prescription for an inhaler. I've never gone without health insurance. You know, even when some people were like preferred not having health insurance to getting Obamacare or something on the exchange, I always had insurance. But other than that, not no. Do you think about money often, aka do you worry about it on a daily basis? Yes. And you know that because I text you about my IRA all the time. <laughs> 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 Throughout coronavirus. <laughs> I've made a coronavirus spending Excel document and I like a new coronavirus budget for me and Neil, who's my boyfriend who I live with for all your listeners. You know, he's out of work right now too because he's he's a freelance Paul McCartney and so he sings in and performs in Beatle bands and obviously all those shows are gone and probably will be gone for like maybe the rest of the year. And I'm bringing in maybe a third of what I used to bring in. So we, you know, we both got our stimulus checks, but we have a new coronavirus budget. I chart every, I'm back to where I was when I first moved to New York, where I'm literally writing down everything we're spending, like figuring out how much more we should spend this month, you know, stuff like that. Also, I'm so glad to have you on this podcast because I want to talk to people that are like in the middle of it to be like, how do we survive because it's easy to be in retirement and be like oh yeah this is what I did you know climbed uphill and it was hard exactly well especially if you're that age now if you're in your 60s now like it the way you started your financial life is so different from how we have had to that political climate question actually I threw that in because after my first couple with the with the old people (laughs) (laughs) um (laughs) I realized that like they started their career in like the early 80s or late 70s. The interest rate was like 20%. Like if you put your money in a bank, you got like 20% interest. That is so different. Maybe when I was in high school, you could get a CD for like 5%. Maybe. But then I never did it, of course. So then by the time I was in college, it was like 1%. And it has basically been 1% or less (laughs) for the last 15 years, 20 years. Okay. When you have excess money, where do you put it? My IRA, uh, savings account, maybe. I usually have like a threshold, like I want to have this month much in my checking account and anything above that after I've paid my rent, I put in my savings account and then some of that I put in my Roth IRA. I'm very anal about all of that. I don't have any, which this is not wise, I'm sure, but I don't have any recurring things for anything. I like to be the one who presses send. I want to, like, I pay my bills actively. I don't have a, you know, what what is it called? Just recurring payment? You you know this about me, that I always am trying to get artists and stuff. I'm like trying to get them to open up IRAs. I'd say most just don't have them and don't think about it. And they only get it if they join Actors Equity or something that like puts it aside for them. So I'm always trying to get the youngest people whenever they start out to like open up an IRA. And as part of that, I think it's super important to do a recurring payment. Like even if it's $10 a month, which people are always are like, that's $120 at the end of the year, Ethan, that's not big of a deal. Like I would, I would do better if I just put in $200 every six months or something. And they're right. But for me, at least in my life, that recurring thing is so important. However, as artists who don't have reliable income, that is like paranoia. Like, like you're like, well, what if I don't make any money that month? $10 goes out. Yeah. I don't want to add any recurring payment to my like, this is what I have to make this month budget, you know, but you're right. Like even just having it be $10, it's literally $120 more than what I would do, you know, cause I'm still probably going to put the same amount in outside of that. When I get big chunks of money, I usually put a percentage into my IRA. Um, other than that, I don't know. I don't have specific savings for specific things. I feel still like a little too poor for that. <laughs> are you bad with money like a stereotypical artist or are you a money wizard? Um, I wouldn't consider myself a money wizard, but I'm good with money. <laughs> it's that writer thing. I'm telling you all the writers. Okay. What was the best financial decision you've ever made? Well, I guess it was Ethan Stimel convincing me to start my IRA. So I guess the best financial decision was staying friends with Ethan Stimel after meeting him <laughs> in 20, 2009. I'm surprised not everybody has said that. Being friends I with was- you? <laughs> Yeah, like my best financial. <laughs> See, I, I I feel like I should keep a list of people that I've gotten to open up IRAs because it's like it's like 
five or ten. Like it's a fair amount. And then take a percentage. Uh, of no, their I don't retirement. want a percentage. Of their retirement. <laughs> but it just makes me feel good because it's like you know, in thirty years they might have that, and like they won't they won't like think of me, but like I will help them. Like I help their future self a little bit. Well, they should think of you. I will think of you when I take my money out of my IRA. I will definitely. <laughs> I'll get a text or whatever the technology is at that time. A mind like it'll just appear in my mind. Ding, Taylor pulled out some money. <laughs> Okay, uh, what was the worst financial decision you've ever made? My Roth IRA? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I really don't know. I don't know if there's like a specific bad uh, financial decision. I'm a little bit anti-higher education right now, but because I went to college, I have my relationships with a lot of my collaborators. I probably wouldn't have gone to SETC and met you and Jill. I wouldn't have met Matt. Going to college was very beneficial, and I, I do appreciate the training I got and and all of that but god I mean if I were to do my life again I don't think I would go to grad school like I it didn't put me in debt more debt necessarily but it didn't well you could you could teach more because of that two reasons I went one I hate school and if I took time off I would never ever ever go back two I thought well I'll go to New York for five years get my street cred work on Broadway and then leave and teach somewhere but I don't want to do that well that's fine if you don't want to do that but like at least you have that option that's true yeah Okay. (laughs) Do you have an entity, a corporation, an LLC, or whenever you get a paycheck, is it just to Taylor Ferreira? When I get a paycheck, it's just to Taylor Ferreira. For the past couple of years, I've been considering getting incorporating myself, but it's been complicated because Matt and I also wanted to incorporate. And so we didn't want to spend the money on a corporation together and individual corporations. So we ended up, we, we have an LLC that we just established in January. I mean, it's for stuff that we collaborate on and our acapella group, The Perfect Fifths and stuff like that. But yeah, so in the meantime, when I have a 1099, other than stuff that I'm working on with Matt, it it just goes to me. Uh, Your income, is it mostly W-2 or 1099? It depends on the year. It's pretty split. I like having a good amount of W-2s to balance the 1099s out. Every summer I work at a, um, I'm, I'm the artistic director at a at a summer camp upstate that I keep trying to get Ethan to work at. I will one day. <laughs> no, you won't. It's fine. Um, uh, is it going on this summer? Because I am in need of work. We don't know. Ooh. <gasps> don't don't get your don't get your hopes up because I guarantee you're not going to have this camp. They're trying to make it happen under any circumstance. They're trying to get themselves considered as an essential service by saying they're childcare. They have game plans for like, if they have to start in July, you know, like if it has to be a shortened camp. So yeah, so that's a W-2, which is great. When I work at NYFA, New York Film Academy, that's a W-2. Any gig that I have, any singing job I do is usually a 1099. But I I have enough W-2s that my taxes aren't aren't an issue. Because on my W-2s, I always, you know, I do zero, right? That's the number I do. Yeah, me too. So that they take out as much as possible. I don't have them take out extra, but doing zero seems to work out tax wise for me. Yeah, I don't have them take out extra. I always do zero. And then when the tax law changed a couple years ago, it doesn't quite work the same anyway, but I still have them take out zero. And that is for W-2s, right? So yeah, I, I'm very lucky because I do have 1099s. So I'm, I'm still able to write off a bunch of stuff. Right? Because isn't that what changed? Like W-2s, you can't write off stuff, essentially. You can write off like 3% or something. When the tax law changed, it made writing off or itemizing like not worth it. They virtually like doubled how much the standard deduction was. I itemize every year. Then I hand it over to the accountant. And I don't quite know if they itemize or not. And then when the tax law changed, me itemizing doesn't really help. And this is another thing, actually, that I'm glad we're talking about because... Everybody always says like, oh, you can write this off, save your receipt, write it off, say blah, blah, blah. Because as artists, that's how it works. When I started itemizing for myself, I started looking into all these things. And it's like, there's all these things you can't itemize. Your subway pass, you can't itemize. You can itemize a percentage of it, I think. Yeah, yeah. But it's not it's not as simple as like, oh, yeah, just save it. Clothing, too. Like, people think, oh, you, you bought that and you wore it to an audition. You can write it off. No. Like, unless it's a uniform that you can only wear at a job, you can't write it off. Gym memberships. And out of town only counts if it's 50 miles away. So, like, there's all these towns that are far from New York, but they're within that 50-mile limit. 
that like doesn't count as an out of town thing, but you assume it does because you had to go stay there. What I've realized is that people say these things as artists, you, you as a young artist, you like listen to them and you're like, oh, I got to save my receipts. And, all. and then when you get down to it, you're like, this person had no idea what they were talking about. They're just saying what everybody assumed. And then when you actually sit down to do your taxes, now that I sort of quite like know how my itemization works, like what I can itemize, what I can't. I, when I hear people say stuff like that, I just in, internally, I roll my eyes and then just talk about something else. <laughs> Cause I don't want to like call them out and be like, you're, you're not. Well, actually. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually. <laughs> Okay, um, do you file your own taxes? Oh, I got a guy. I think it's so worth it if you're, like, I know people don't want to spend $300 or whatever it is for whoever you find, but it's so worth it. Oh, my God. Because of everything we've just said. We don't, we literally don't know tax law, so we, you don't want to get in trouble. Not that people who make, you know, $30,000 a year are, are going to be high on the priority list for the IRS, but still, you don't want to get in trouble. And not only that, you don't know all the all the ways you can benefit either. Yeah, so it's it's highly worth it. We started using a tax guy after we were in Nymph in 2014. I'm I'm at someone else. I, I have someone else now, but I haven't done my taxes since 2013. Side tangent: 2014 was six years ago. That show was in a festival. How much did it cost you? Because you 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 and Matt, the writer, self-produced it. I feel like Nymph is like higher education to me. <laughs> like I am very grateful for the relationships that Nymph gave me. I've gotten a lot of work in the future because of relationships that I developed at Nymph. Having, having a Nymph credit as a writer has been very beneficial as well. Other than that, my God, it's it was so expensive and it, it was ridiculous. It Overall, I think our budget was like 50,000, maybe 45,000. We had a Kickstarter and that raised about like close to 20 because it was the first time. That's the thing. It's like, I feel like everyone has one good Kickstarter in them. After that, I'm like, I'm never going to crowdsource again because it's like I've already blew my wad. And then after that, we did a lot of uh, concerts, like we did tours in our hometowns and stuff like that and uh, and raised money that way. We did workshops, like my mom's children's theater company, and we did a workshop for them, and, and we got to keep the fees for that. Technically, our LLC, <laughs> we still have a bank account from then. Like, technically, it owes us money still, and we have that documented, and, like, we... Whatever. <laughs> I just wanted to talk about that, because, like, if someone is listening to this who hasn't moved to New York yet or is in a different city and wants to produce something of their own. Just to put your show into a festival, which is not its own production, you're not spending a ton of advertising money just to be in a festival, $50,000. And that's six years ago. That's six years ago. So now what is, you know, 60, 70,000? A lot of nymph shows spent close to 100,000. Just to be in the festival, we had to pay $6,000. And, and now also, well, before nymph, shut down, they changed the rules on how many union actors you had to use. We didn't have a rule about that. So we, we had a few union actors, but then we had a lot of non-union actors and we paid them differently. But yeah, it, it was very expensive. It was hugely expensive. But you did it. Even though you're not rich, neither one of you is rich or wealthy or has uh, wealth connections, you still, because you're artists, you totally made it happen. Yes. Yes. And like I said, you got one of those. Usually, like, if you have a network of friends, you have one of those in you. And then, like, because, and, and since then, ever since then, I always donate to people's Kickstarters or GoFundMes or things like that that are about a project. Because I just feel like I owe, I owe the world $20,000 or however much we, we earned from that, you know? So I always donate. I've gotten into producing. Like, I started in design. Now I'm producing a bit. And, like, I produce, it's not released yet, but your propaganda show, you've turned into a podcast. And I associate produced that. But anyway, so now people are approaching me, even though I don't know what I'm doing, but people are approaching me to produce stuff. Sometimes they come and they're like, okay, well, this is how much like I, I think I can get. And then we can do a Kickstarter for the rest of it. And I'm just like, no, I just refuse to do Kickstarter. Like it's, it's too much. I mean, I've never done one, but like, it's too much work. You're going to owe all those people something in return. Like, even if you don't owe them, you're going to feel like you owe them all something in return. And so I'm like, you know what? There are people out there who have money that want to help people, that want to produce things. We just have to find those people, 
easier said than done. I think there's something wrong in a society that relies on Kickstarter so much. It's filling a void that's needed, but that shouldn't exist. Why is our society set up that we're doing that? Well, especially when there are Kickstarters and GoFundMes for reasons other than the arts, for health reasons or things like that. That's what's the most upsetting, that people have to crowdsource to have an operation is what's the most upsetting in this country. That's a whole other podcast that we're going (laughs) to... I know. (laughs) We've started several podcasts in this one interview. Yeah. We might have answered this, or you might have answered this a little bit. Do you invest and how? Um, Yeah, just my Roth IRA. And is that your retirement plan? Like, do you have any other sort of... No, I don't have anything else yet. You've sort of hinted like, I don't have a great... Like, I'm not famous. I'm not, you know. (laughs) But... The fact is you've lived in New York for 10 years and you don't have a server job. And to me, not saying you've made it, but sort of you made it. No, I'm very, I am very proud of the work that I've done in order to get to the position I'm in currently. None of my jobs make me want to die and they all have to do with something that I'm passionate about and that I, you know, went to school for and that I've wanted to do. So like it, I'm very proud and happy about that. I wish I tried to do more when I first moved to New York, pursued those jobs that have to do with my skills a little bit more. Um, But I, I don't know if I knew how to look for them. My first job after serving, I sang in a baby's rock band. And there are so many of those. Some of them, you only have to be a singer. Some, The one I did, I played guitar and I sang. You could be a pianist, you could be a drummer. Like, it, It's such a good day job for musicians or even musician adjacent, which I feel describes me. But it helped hone my skills. I'm a better singer and a better musician because of it, you know. Or like these little puppet shows that I do, you know, I get to perform for kids every once in a while. And it's it's such a good, it's such a good day job because, you know, you get that artistic outlet of being a performer um, and engaging with an audience. And it's helped me as a writer, you know, performing these shows. The people I perform with, Stephen Elkins and Rebecca Aparicio and uh, myself and Matt have started a new children's theater company where we're writing kid shows and performing in those shows has helped me as a children's theater writer because I know what resonates with little baby audiences. Two two questions that I'm going to ask and because I think maybe they overlap. How important has your personal support system been And how important has your professional network been? I started talking about this earlier a little bit. You know, when I first moved to New York, I didn't have a huge amount of savings. You know, I didn't have the amount of savings that one should have before they moved to a big city. So I'm very lucky and, you know, privileged to have a family that was able to support me, fill fill in the gap of what I wasn't able to make the first few months that I was in New York until I was able to have enough jobs to support myself. That's huge. And you know, they they helped me in college as well. They helped me move, um, all that stuff. I had loans and I had grants and scholarships for all the like technical things, but I had family support in everything else, which was hugely important. Of course, my friend group in New York is hugely important for emotional support and and, uh, and career support, all that kind of stuff. And yeah, professional network is kind of interlaced with my friend group as well. I don't know if it's the case for everyone, but I definitely feel like I work with my friends for two reasons, because I like and respect them and I and I enjoy what they bring to the creative table, but also because I want to hang out with them more. And in New York, it's very hard to hang out with anyone, especially when you're an artist and you're working to make money. And then in your time off, you're working to push a project that you're passionate about. If you don't work with your friends in one of those two capacities, then you're probably not going to see them very often. So yeah, that, you know, they, they're interlaced in that way. But yeah, my professional network is, is huge. Most of the gigs I get are because of people I've worked with and friends I have who know what it's like to work with me and they want to work with me and they, you know, recommend me or, you know, you know how it is. How much of your success has been hard work versus luck? I'll let you know once I'm successful. <laughs> but I'm, gosh, yeah, I don't know because I, I, I feel successful on a lot of levels, but I don't think, you know, I haven't broken in anything yet, really. I think a lot of it 
is hard work and then you get the luck at some point. It's like putting in the hard work for a long enough time, amount of time that you're going to get luck at some point. Um, what is your financial goal for this year? <laughs> I mean, I had a certain number in my head and in my budgets for what I wanted by the end of the year, but obviously I'm adjusting that. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. This is crazy times. <laughs> Um, what is your personal goal for the year? To not get COVID-19. Uh, good luck. Break a leg with that. <laughs> what would, it, would you have a goal? If money wasn't an issue, what would your goal be? I would love to buy a house and own the thing I live in would be really nice. And to have it be more than one bedroom. But yeah, I think I would have, if, if money weren't an issue at all, it would be a weird transition if money weren't an issue. Because there's a very fine balance between having too much free time and not having enough time when it comes to productivity. Productivity is always my goal. I always want to write more. I always want to do more. If I have, if you have too much free time and I find this personally, and I know it, it's one thing in quarantine when there's a pandemic going on and everyone's emotional state is out of whack, that free time is different from normal free time. But in the, in normal reality, if I have too much free time, I am not very productive. And then if I don't have enough free time, I'm not very productive. There's a there's that fine balance of I have to do this job this day and this day and this day. So that means I really have to make this day productive and this these hours productive. So yeah, I guess if money weren't an issue, I would still try to find some sort of schedule that forced me to work. What financial advice would you give yourself right when you started? Ask Ethan if you should start an IRA now. <laughs> You, yeah, but when you started, you should have started that like five years prior. Yeah, exactly. That, well, that's what I mean. Like if when I first started, when I first moved to New York, even though, I mean, I guess once I didn't need my parents to help me, you know, like, so once I got my serving job, I should have opened my IRA then. Yeah. Other than that, I guess it would be the same, the thing I said earlier about how I wish that I had looked for survival jobs that had to do with my skills a little earlier when I stopped being a server and started only doing those jobs, I definitely had to take a little bit of a pay cut for a little bit because serving can be a very lucrative job. So that's tough. But I I wish I had started those jobs earlier. So I guess that's what I would tell myself. Um, okay, now questions from Nicole, my wife, who is a non-theater person. Why do a majority of theater people not have any savings or retirement savings? Ouch. <laughs> Her question, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> I would say because they're not friends with Ethan Stimel. <laughs> it takes so much financial dancing, I guess, to survive in New York while also pursuing a career. So it's it's difficult. If you're a person in a normal career that you are you have a job and it's a normal job and you're not constantly... Steady paycheck, yeah. Yeah, it's a steady paycheck and you're not constantly hustling for another job. It's easier to... I, I, I would say it's easier to have savings and retirement savings and stuff like that. Plus, you're, you probably have something set up with that job where every paycheck, a percentage is going towards retirement without you even thinking about it. Artists don't have that until they join a union. I think the artist's struggle is that they're working so much, they don't have time to think about their finances. Plus, they don't get paid a lot. And they're working for free so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're working for free or for very little, a lot. So much energy is spent and so much time is spent on, on projects that don't give you that much money. And then your survival jobs give you money that literally help you survive, which implies that you're not thinking about retirement. This is a question that you don't know the answer to, but how do you think COVID-19 is going to affect the future of the theater? I don't know. I'm wondering how we're going to start opening up, like if there's going to be capacity changes. You know, what would be nice is if this affects rents. If theater, if houses half are forced to make rent less or else they're just not going to have any shows in them. You know, like that would be a, a great side effect of this. I mean, I don't know, obviously anything, but Nicole is works in commercial real estate and they're talking about all these things like elevators. Well, if an elevator can take 20 people, well, now it can only take four people. So you can only shut all four. So you can let elevator lines get long, but eventually it's like you just can't have as many people working in a building. 
So then why do people need to be in New York? So so I think rent will, like landlords will have to lower rents. Like in theaters, it's like you're going to have to lower rent in half because if only half the audience can come in. Or else you just won't have shows in, in your theater. I wonder if there will be more streaming stuff, if people will kind of take to the formats that we've been forced to deal with. I don't think to the extent that we're doing them now, because I don't think anything works as well as, you know, like having shows like SNL hats off for that attempt. And there was a lot of great stuff, but you know, it's not the same. None of these shows, especially comedies, none of these shows are the same that used to be in front of a live audience, you know, like it's, but I wonder if any element of that is going to be, is going to continue. Who knows? To be determined. Is it a good time for people to be studying the arts and starting out in the arts? I teach acting at New York Film Academy, and we've had to adjust to Zoom classes. We just had final monologue presentations over Zoom, and it's it's interesting, and it, it you know, but it's it's not the same. If this is a thing that's going to continue, this is when I would want to study history or philosophy or something that I don't need to interact with other people in order to do. New York has been the place for live theater, like Broadway. Um, And a lot of people that move here have to have like a day job, like a serving job or something. Because the economy is all haywire right now, is New York still a good place for people to move to for theater? Or should they go somewhere else? Yeah, God. I mean, like everything just depends on the next couple months, right? So I don't really know, but I would love it. I would love it if New York doesn't have to be the place. I think New York has gotten out of hand. It's impossible for new work, not impossible, but it's very difficult for new work to get anywhere because of how inflated New York is and how no one's willing to take a risk on something that isn't a well-known name, doesn't have a very famous actor. Like, it's stifling to creativity the way New York is right now. So I'm, I would love it if, if something happened to make it more like, you know, regional theaters and regional marketplaces got a little boost. Yeah, I love it when other uh, marketplaces thrive. I loved when Orlando was great in like the 90s. You know, that was a hop in time. Atlanta seems to be doing pretty well. So I would love it if, if that changed a little bit. So, but that being said, no, I'm, I'm, New York is still, I sometimes don't want to live in New York, but (laughs) I love, I love New York because I love New York, but I also love New York because it is full of people who are hustling, who are creating new stuff, who are doing really cool things. So I don't know how that can be replicated in other places because that is a really specifically New York thing. Yeah, and I, I think there will be other marketplaces just because I think people are going to travel less. They'll want something to do, and so they might go see their own theater more. So I think there will be a little boost. You can't move Broadway, so I don't think it'll completely change. Are you in any unions? I'm not. I'm in no unions. It would be great. Yeah, it would be great to be in a union. I have nothing against unions. Right, exactly, exactly. Um, well, the thing... With the unions is like, for a lot of artists, that's the only way they have retirement, anything. So, and and it's like, that's not something they control. Like, they only get a union job because the job happens to be union or whatever. They're so good for theater people because they force retirement onto them a little bit. Yes. And it it is a a tricky answer for actors, union-wise, because not only is is it hard to get your equity card, but then when you have the option... If you've been successfully working non-ep, it is a different world than when you become equity. And it's more beneficial to you financially and uh, you can get further. But it it does sometimes, I know a lot of actors who it feels a little bit like, it's all about the timing about when they join equity, you know. And that's a complication because like Jill Twist is in a union, writer's union, but she can write anything she wants. Like she can do non-union jobs. I'm in the design union. And I can do non-union jobs, but actors' equity—you have to get permission to do another job. And I like—I understand why they do it, but yeah. Um, oh, oh! I just want to say this too: that you don't have a Tony Award. What? You don't have an Emmy Award, <laughs> and I don't think you have an Obie Award or a Drama Desk. I don't have a Peabody. Or now your critics. <laughs> Pulitzer. But we can come back to this podcast in 10 years because I am fully confident that you are going to win a Tony Award. I assume it will be for writing. Maybe it's for performing or something. But you you are on the trajectory 
I'm, I'm just telling you, I don't know if it's 10 years or 20 years, but like, we will look back. You're like, you're a hard worker. You're very talented. You absolutely should be talking to me about this because you're just like very smart, very intellectual, much smarter than I will ever be. Futuristically, you have a Tony Award. Theoretically, I do. This is why my best financial decision ever was becoming friends with Ethan Steinle. <laughs> I love that answer. <laughs> Just listen to that support. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, final two questions. What separates those that have a successful career in theater versus those that stop or never get started? Other than literal privilege, because I, I don't want to downplay the fact that, you know, people who don't, even the like $300 a month my parents gave me when I first moved here enabled me to move to New York. And not everyone in the world, so many people don't have that. But besides that, I would say just pushing or pushing, as we say. Yeah, push. Um, <laughs> like, I, I just think that it's a marathon and you just, you gotta constantly put in work and constantly put stuff out there and constantly just stay in the game until it, it happens, right? So, like, I understand people who don't want to do that. You know, I understand people who are like, well, if it doesn't work out in the first couple of years, then I, I would rather have financial security. And I'd rather live in a place where I don't have to pay ridiculous rents and living expenses aren't as high. But I do think it's, it's just c continuing. I agree. <laughs> There's no like secret. Obviously, you can get really lucky. Yeah. And obviously, like skills and talent is, has to do with it. It's like you have to have everything. You have to have talent and you have to have skills and you have to have luck and you have to push and you have to continue. It's a different ratio for every person who's successful. Because if you look at successful people, yeah, they got lucky, but they put themselves in a place for that luck. They kept working for it. And there are the few exceptions where it's like, that person really is not talented at all and not hardworking. Like that's much easier to happen in TV or uh, movies or something like that. In theater. It's... And I still, I bet most of those people are still hardworking. Oh, absolutely. And if they're not, they're not going to succeed for very long. You know, I think Jill Twiss's story is the best example of this of anything relationships and luck had a had a part in things but god she was like writing jokes for hours every day she was putting it out there so the world could have access to it right and which is why you have the exact same story as she does because you have now been for 10 years writing jokes putting them out there and in 10 years you will have four emmys <laughs> <laughs> That's that's the equation. Yeah, that's just math. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, we laugh, but I believe it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, last question. Where can people find out more about you? They can find me on Instagram. They can find a lot of my songs on YouTube, though a lot of them are very dated when our biggest threat was the evil Mitt Romney. Um, <laughs> right. Oy vey. Wait, your Instagram, at Taylor Ferreira? It's just... Taylor Ferreira with no space. You can find my acapella group on Instagram. They're the underscore perfect underscore fifths. Fantastic. Well, Taylor, future Tony winner uh, or Emmy winner, whatever word you want, winner. I want all of them. <laughs> uh, EGOT. So future EGOT winner. <laughs> Thank you so much for talking to me. I really appreciate it. You're an amazing person. Aw, thanks for asking me, Ethan. That was our interview with Taylor Ferreira. My takeaways were, don't acquire student loan debt. If you need to raise money for a project, you can really only use crowdsourcing one time before it becomes a burden on your network. Open a Roth IRA as early as possible and regularly add money to it. If you're going to itemize your tax deductions, research what actually counts as a deduction. It is important to have a support system both personally and financially to start out as an artist. That's it for today. Next week, we will talk with Melody Brooks, the artistic director of the New Perspectives Theater Company, a nonprofit theater company in New York City that has survived 30 years with a mission to produce community work with a focus on women and minorities. Until next time, break a leg. Thank you for listening to Artistic Finance. Find more information on our website, artisticfinance.com. Please subscribe to our podcast and please leave a review so others can find us. Artistic Finance is produced in New York City by Ethan and Nicole Spimel. Producing consultant Anne Nygren-Doherty. Graphics and website by Josh Cutler. Music by Chang Liu.